Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased to have with me today Peter Moore to tell us all about his new book titled Life, Liberty and the Pursuit of Happiness, Britain and the American Dream from 1740 to 1776, published uh, just now in 2023 by Penguin. This is a fascinating book that helps us understand what is often called the American Revolution, through the generation that came before the Declaration of Independence in 1776, which is really helpful because it allows us to understand what these things meant, what life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, what that meant to a lot of these key people, for example, Benjamin Franklin. So Peter, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast to tell us all about it. Very great pleasure. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Thank you. Before we dive into your book, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit and explaining why you decided to write this? Yeah, sure. So I'm um, an English author. I've been writing books for about a decade. Um, generally, they um, I think they could be bookended as being um, part of uh, the story of the British Enlightenment. So I've written about science. I wrote a book about a ship, which was about the uh, the ship Endeavour, um, which went to the South Seas in the 1770s. So that was a book about exploration. I wrote a book many years ago about uh, a double murder in a little village. I can tell you about that another time maybe. But um, this is really a progression of this theme um, of enlightenment and Britain that I've been really interested in for so long. And um, it really takes me into the world of ideas and politics uh, like never before. And when you're talking about the enlightenment and politics, obviously the American Revolution is there. It's this massive event. And I wanted to try and understand it um, in a way for myself, but also to engage with something which I think is a bit of a hole in scholarship because the American Revolution for all its great majesty and its importance is little um, studied in the UK. There might be um, pretty obvious reasons for that, but um, there was an imbalance, I thought, that there was a great deal of excellent scholarship that went on in the States around this founding narrative, which is... um, which is just a perennial part of the literature and the history from school days upwards. In the UK, you'd be lucky if you found anything to do with um, the American Revolution on any school syllabuses whatsoever. So I thought it would be it would be good to take a fresh look from um, um, from the British point of view at this big moment, and um, uh, and, and and by doing so, really to get back to the original history to. Um, find a bit of enlightenment myself. And um, there was something that Gay Talese, the great New Yorker writer, once said that uh, history is often best told um, by the losers. I think he actually said that um, the losers' dressing room is always the more interesting of the two. He was referring to um, professional sports. And I think there's something, I mean, there's something humorous in that, but there's also something instructive in it because um the British have never really, I don't think, come to come to terms with what happened in the 1770s. It was seen as a, a great national embarrassment and and like kind of life moved on very quickly. The empire moved on in different ways. And um, I think if a lot of the stories that were connected um, from the British point of view were forgotten entirely. So they were there waiting for me and I went out to find them. In this goal of seeking to um, excavate in a lot of ways this history and remember it in the ways you've described, how and why did you choose to focus on the life and key professional relationships of Benjamin Franklin in this goal of bringing this history back? Well, that's really a question um, which has two main answers. The um, the first one is... Uh, is really to do with uh, storytelling, I suppose. I'll put it in those terms, because if you are going to tell a generational history, um, it's a British prehistory of the American Revolution. I mean, you're just completely daunted to begin with. You could try, uh, you know, kind of to write an eagle eyes view of all the things that happened in Britain from the 1740s to the 1770s, but you'd, um, I think you'd drive yourself mad. And I think with any, 
like work of storytelling, the first challenge is is kind of one of of whittling down where are going to be the points of focus, and um, you know, like kind of what are the contours of the story really? And uh, Franklin is a character who I've always known about, and I've always found deeply fascinating. He, of course. Um, is widely known for his work on electricity, but that was only one part of his life. He was also a diplomat, but before that he was a printer. He was a businessman. He wrote the first um, autobiography, as it came to be known, the founding classic of uh, American literature, the story of his life, which was, um, you know, the rags to riches story, the boy who was born in Milk Street in Boston, but then grew up to to dine with uh, kings in Versailles. So, you know, Franklin was an attraction for me right at the beginning. And um, I thought his attitude towards enlightenment life was something that really needed to exploring. So early on in the book, I started off with Franklin. I thought, I thought I'm going to begin with Franklin because he's a very solid, you know, kind of uh, foundational character, really. Um, he's there in, in 1714 Philadelphia um, as an aspiring printer. Um, and he's also there in, in 1776. He's part of the Committee of Five who were um, at charge with drawing up this Declaration of Independence, which really is the end of the book and the start of the United States of America. But um, so I knew I had Cap Franklin there as a character um, all through. And, you know, books aren't they don't come out perfectly formed like a baby after nine months and you can see them they're you know they're kind of all these bits of um of interests i suppose to begin with and with with franklin i i knew i wanted to start with him but as i went through it became quite clear to me that i needed someone to be there all the way through as a kind of you know center to the book and um Franklin's story really became that core and I followed him from Philadelphia to London back to Philadelphia back to London back to Philadelphia back to London all these times um, which gave not only Franklin as a central character but some really specific geographic locations you had Market Street in Philadelphia and uh, really Craven Street in London which is where Franklin's London lodgings were and with that spine, the book, which had once felt so daunting and impossible, just started to feel legible and exciting. And um, and and so that's like the kind of storytelling aspect of this. But um, also Life, Liberty and the Pursuit of Happiness, so those particular words which are so famous to, um, you know, kind of in in American political um, life and intellectual life and and the founding stories. Well, well, Franklin was there when those words were written. He was uh, probably one of the first people to read them after Jefferson had drafted them. He may well have had a, um, a little hand in the editorial um, kind of part as well, because I think it was actually written as Life and Liberty and the Pursuit of Happiness. And you can, if you go today to the New York Public Library, you can have a look at the the original rough uh, draft of the Declaration, which is a um, fascinating document. And you can see not only Jefferson's beautiful schoolmasterly hand writing these words out, but you can also see interventions um, from Franklin as well. So you get this combination of different different characters. So, so Franklin, um, yeah, in, in storytelling sense, he was there, but he was also really engaged with the ideas I wanted to talk about. Uh, Franklin had a lot to say about the business of living, not just through his autobiography, but through um, papers he um, he wrote about continually through through his life, either in in, in pamphlet form or in in the newspaper, and um, had things to say about the ideas of human happiness, which was something I wanted to uh, engage with as well. Franklin was a was an optimist who thought that. Um, I mean, he's got a, a nice little quote about happiness. He talks about it being like the weather and sometimes it's sunny, sometimes it's rainy and we must learn to live with the storms is his idea about happiness, which is a kind of stoic I- ideal, I suppose. Um, but yeah, he, he, he engaged with all of these things in such a, an attractive and playful, um, engaging way that he became the most obvious central character for the book. And yeah, he's... Um, I think they're from the prologue to the epilogue. So you'll find out a lot more about Benjamin Franklin and particularly about his London life and his London friendships. So 
thinking then about Benjamin Franklin um, as engaging, and I certainly found many aspects of his writing came through in the book, as you said, in that engaging, sometimes playful way, thinking of him in a lot of senses, somewhat representative, really, of what that generation in America were thinking of Britain, I at least found that this aspect of the history is one that I had encountered the least. Kind of what did Americans think about Britain before sort of everything got bad, right? Before the years of crisis as we get towards 1776. So can you help us remember that? What did colonists like Benjamin Franklin think about Britain if we focus on the beginning of the 18th century rather than the end? This is just the best question because I think it's it's a really important one and it's one which is very often considered today. And it's one which I suppose runs very counter to the Hamiltonish narrative that we are most familiar with today, by which I mean the the story of the you know the puce faced red coats and Lord North with his tyrannical dictates and um and and the colonists rising up against them, which is a story which which we're very familiar with, which I have to add is is not a false narrative. That that is a very true story. But equally, if you dig back, you, you find that there's a very different connection between Britain and the American colonies. And this, for me, was a nice thing to write about because it felt off kilter. It felt slightly daring. Um, but at the same time, it was this kind of gr- gritty reality of history. So for the first 76 years of the 18th century, Britain was the nation in the Western world which was considered to be revolutionary, to be exciting, to be different. It had lived through the experiences of the 17th century, where one king had had its head chopped, his head chopped off, another one had been chased out, and it had won for itself this kind of selection of privileges, which really meant something fundamentally new and important um, for British people. It meant that they had um, liberties, they had right to participate, even though it was to a very curtailed extent, but in um, a fledgling democratic process. So there would be elections. The king could not throw people into jail um, at his at his whim. Um, there needed to be a parliament. And this progressed in the early years of the 18th century, where um, you get this important moment when the Hanoverians come over and really what happens then is that um, parliament rules through the monarchy rather than monarchy ruling through the parliament so this is a hugely important moment um, early on and something of which Britons were very proud and by Britons I mean not just the people who lived in England but increasingly after the Act of Union the people who lived in Scotland um, and also the people who lived in the British overseas colonies in North America, 26 colonies, I I believe, and only 13 of which broke away to become the United States. And this period was the period of Franklin's childhood, where um, people in the American colonies would look across the Atlantic um, very fondly towards a mother country, which provided some degree of protection against the French, who were seen as the greatest of the threats to them at the time, but who also provided a system of law um, and also provided a rich cultural life, which was just not available in America at the time. So um, some of the most memorable scenes in Franklin's autobiography are those when he's a young boy in Boston and he's he's eagerly scenting out the latest uh, spectator or the works of Addison and Steele um, beyond that. And this is where he learns to write. He, he learns a prose style from that. But more than that, he earns, learns an, an attitude towards life. So much so that Franklin, when he does, in fact, go to London at the age of 20, is um, is able to see this this land of his dreams for himself, the the place of Newton, the place of Ad- Addison, as I said, um, the place of increased mercantile success, where you could stroll along the Strand and look at these shops which had the riches of the East, that you could walk into Fleet Street and see these beautiful scientific instruments that were promising 
to uh, reveal the the secrets of nature. When Franklin, you know, this is a point I opened the book in 1740. Franklin's looking um, at America, but he's thinking about Enlightenment Britain as well. It's by no means assured what kind of country, um, if indeed it's going to be a separate political entity at all. I mean, Franklin, who is very long-sighted, does realise that there's going to be a partition at some point, um, although I don't think he thought it was going to come as early as 1776. But I think what he's very interested in early on is is bringing the Enlightenment culture of Great Britain to the American colonies to find a space for this free-thinking, progressive, capitalistic you know, kind of set of ideas Um, which are obviously synonymous with the United States of America today, but were by no means assured um, back in 1740 when you had different worldviews competing for preeminence. And, um, yeah, so so in short, my my answer to your question is, what did they think of Britain in the the early part of the century? I think it was a great deal of affection. I think there was a huge sense of of um, aspiration towards Britain. You know, if you were to take your, if you were a a, a wealthy son of a prominent family in the 1730s, 1740s, you would go off to um, to Britain to to be finished, to see the world, to see where where society was going. And and that's a part of the story which is um, sometimes forgotten about today in light of what happened later. Speaking of things that are forgotten in light of what happened later, Ben Franklin is on currency to this day. He's a founding father. And yet he did not start off as one of those gentlemen from a rich family that gets sent to London to be finished. How did then this transformation happen? How did Benjamin Franklin become a gentleman? Why did he want to? Why was this important? (laughs) Well, the, the short answer to your question is with very great dif- difficulty because, um, th- th- I mean, we're talking about um, a social setup which is quite difficult to reconcile with our world today. So the 18th century was um, a world of very many social um kind of distinctions, you could say. Um, and these are obviously, um, you know, including race and gender, two, two very big ones, but also class, origin, people's origins were important. So if you were from Ireland or or from Scotland or you were an immigrant from, uh, from modern-day Germany, all of these things had a bearing on your identity. But as Gordon Wood pointed out, uh, the great scholar of the American Revolution, Gordon Wood at, at Harvard, um, it's really interested in his writing about this and and uh, uh, and this this claim that that actually goes into the declaration of independence that all men are created equal which today may seem a kind of commonplace bit of cant as much as anything but back then that was a really really um revolutionary statement to make because um as i said before people were certainly not created equal and if you to put one big distinction through society would argues that that distinction is between the ordinary folk which accounted for pretty much everyone those who were um, born to work to toil to to pray and to die those those people were the majority but there was a kind of oligarchy at the top which were the gentry the gentlemen the people who ran things and um you know pretty much without exception, these were the people who mattered. These were the people who had money, they had influence, they had position, and um, they sat on uh, committees who made decisions, for example. And um, Franklin didn't belong to this class. At the the beginning, as I said before, he started out the most humble origins. I think he was the youngest of 17 children. Um, He was, uh, uh, you know, these these were not um, origins for him to talk openly about. Uh, Today, it might be something of a um a heroic story of um beating adversity in 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 the manner of a modern day memoir back then 
that wasn't really going to help you. Um, Franklin worked his way up. He kept quiet originally about his origins, as far as we can tell. Um, in Philadelphia, he had this chance of remaking himself, and he did very successfully. He became a printer, and then he became a very prosperous printer. And then he became a printer with uh, with connections at the Philadelphia Assembly. Then he became the postmaster of Philadelphia. Um, I mean, this is this upward trajectory. His his life was going on from the very early moments. He was powered by a, a force of will and um, a brilliance of, of of personality and talent. But Franklin had this dilemma that I begin the book with, which is a fundamental dilemma for many in 18th century life, which is how do you transcend your status? How do you make yourself into something new? How do you become a gentleman when you're not one to begin with in a world where hereditary honour counts for so much? Hereditary honour, by which I mean the, um, you know, the kind of the power of bloodlines, things that we um, that we certainly don't regard in the same way today as they did back then. So Franklin has this um, this problem of uh, status he feels that he's an equal of those uh, gentlemen who run things but he has um no way of um of really i suppose joining them and um he finds a way in the mid 1740s which is beyond money it's beyond property it's beyond simple connection and that way is science he he begins a series of electrical experiments that really revolutionize his personal reputation, but they change him into a new kind of person. He's no longer Franklin, the tradesman with the inky fingers who has to work and doesn't have any property of his own. He becomes something which is kind of similar to that. He becomes the ingenious scientist, which is um, something which I suppose it's anachronistic to talk about a, a scientist at the time because that, term itself wouldn't be used for another hundred years but the ingenious natural philosopher the person who can sort things out the person who can see the person who has experimental skills or a genius they would they would say in those times these are all um these are all kind of new things and they're connected with the glamour of the scientific revolution in england with the identity of people like isaac newton robert hook Christopher Wren, all of these great characters. And um, a little bit of it rubs off on Franklin, and then a lot rubs off on Franklin, because in a few years' time, from between about 1745, 46, that kind of period, to 1752, he undertakes a series of electrical experiments which culminate in um, this may be a, an apocryphal story, we're not quite sure, but this uh, the, this story of him climbing the spire of Christchurch in Philadelphia in, a, in an electrical storm and flying a kite. You know, we're, we're familiar with this through, um, through portraiture and, uh, and so on. But what, what this shows is that Franklin is no ordinary man. He's a man with, um, he may not be a gentleman, but he's, he's no ordinary man. So maybe he becomes someone of, of the third class, the new man, the enlightenment man. And, um, and that's really, I think, a fun story and, and one that I spend a bit of time on um, early on in the book. I'd love to pick up on that idea of kind of something that we take for granted a bit now, um, but really wasn't then, just like the idea of kind of all people being created equal. Actually, hang on, hereditary honour, not so much. So in a similar vein as to what you've just described for us, the transformation of the gentleman, um, we take for granted today international trade, international communication. And yet, as demonstrated by the relationship between Benjamin Franklin and what seems to be his closest um, confidant, really, and business partner in England, that was really not the case back then. Um, trade, communication was a lot harder. So what can we learn about kind of this period more broadly in terms of the commercial connections, the communication connections between England and the American colonies by looking at this key relationship? Well, you can certainly learn um, a great deal by looking at Franklin, who was, after all, in this very beginning phase of his professional life, um, someone who was deeply involved in the world of trade. And um, I was perhaps slightly underselling him before when I said he was a printer, because he was a printer, but he was also 
at the same time he was uh, he was interested in everything if you went downstairs to his shops you could not just only buy paper and uh, copies of Paul Richard and the Pennsylvania Gazette or whatever you could also um in, you know, kind of buy books, you could buy telescopes, you could buy um, really anything that Franklin thought had a market um, for selling. So famously, you could buy the family's own crown soap, which uh, I have to say was, it'd be interesting to see if that could be recreated today. It wasn't a um, an import day because that one was created uh, in, in the family way uh, <laughs> with the Franklin stamp. But yeah, Franklin's um, transatlantic trading really was a kind of another problem for it because I said early on that there was a, a great deal of affection um, and um, attempt to emulate what had happened in Britain in the American colonies. So you can see, therefore, it doesn't take a, a great leap of the imagination um, or logic to see that things that were made in England would have a particular currency and price in the colonies. And um, that could go down to items of fashion. But um, in, in particular, in Franklin's case, we're, we're talking about books here. And um, Franklin tried for very many years to establish connections in um, in London because he'd been there before and I mean, he'd seen how vibrant the book trade was. In London, he wanted to bring some of that to, uh, to to Philadelphia. One thing that he particularly tried to do early on in the book, I read about this as well, which is his um, ill-fated attempt to, um, to to create an American magazine, which emulates the uh, the Gentleman's Magazine. This is a massive failure, a story which is actually quite um, over, it's not very well known in in Franklin's life, but um, it it was uh, certainly well known to him in, in the seventeen forties. But he did have more luck in 1743-4 when he forged a connection with um, a printer of uh, more or less the same age as him in London, um, an aspiring Scottish-born printer called William Strawn. Um, for a long time, I didn't know how to pronounce his name, but I've been assured it is Strawn, so we'll go with that. Um, so William Strawn is another of my half-dozen characters in the book, and Strawn unlike Franklin, is pretty much forgotten, but um, in his day was was a, a kind of colossus. He, he later on in his career, becomes, um, a, you know, the, the owner of the greatest printing house in London. He's the printer to the king. Um, he's a member of parliament. He sits behind Lord North in the 1770s uh, as the... Uh, the kind of intolerable acts are put through Parliament. He's right there in the political um, world. But really, Franklin's connection with Strawn dates back to 1740s, where they were both uh, kind of on the make. They had a bit of cash, but they were not rich um, by, you know, the standards of the day. Um, and it's just a wonderful coming together of two very, uh, you know, very good characters. Strawn is a migrant who's come into London. He's Scottish. He taps into that new network of Scottish migrants who are who are um, coming down in the generation after the Act of Union. Um, there's a moment when Franklin writes a letter. Well, I won't go into the full story, actually. Strawn writes a letter to Franklin first, and, and a letter comes back. Um, the two of them very quickly fall into a very um, good business friendship and um, and books start to go across the Atlantic. So your original point about what this relationship between Franklin and Strawn, which I think is what you were hinting at, tells us about transatlantic trade, is the peril of it. Because um, it's not like today, if I want to order something from China or Japan or America, and it, it appears... Um, in very short order on my um, on my doorstep. Of course, that's an obvious point to make, but sometimes we don't think how difficult it was to transport these objects across great space. Six weeks to cross the Atlantic was seen as a very reasonable voyage. I think the fastest was about four weeks, but it could equally be three months if everything went wrong. Um, books, which is what Franklin was particularly trading in were, you know, very 
uh, high value products. So if you lost one, then you your margins could be out. If you lost the whole shipment, then well, you could be very nearly ruined. Um, but Strawn really liked Franklin. He liked the idea of tapping into this under um, serviced American market. He was, um, you know, kind of someone who he was good at spotting spotting opportunities, um, financial opportunities in particular. And he um, he started sending these books to Franklin on trust. There are other books that he sends to America, which um, which he loses heavily on when the when the bills are, are not paid. And um, there's actually a, there's a little side story to what I'm telling you now. Um, Strawn sends about 140 pounds worth of books to a man called um, James Reed, and and the, the money never returns. And um, the story of how Strawn tries to recoup that uh, that debt goes on for the rest of his life, and actually becomes. Um, the subject of quite a nice little monograph, um, academic one really, which is just called Printer Strawn's Book Account. Um, anyway, he never got the money back, and um, that was that was a shame for him there. But with Franklin, the story was quite different. Um, the, there was trust, um, money was made, and over the course of uh, you know a few years, uh, it, it, it was quite it was quite clear that this was going to be. You know, profitable as a business link. So, in I'll, I'll tell you in a in a very short way that Strawn would buy the books in London. He'd package them up. They'd go to Philadelphia. Franklin would sell them in Market Street. Um, to give you some idea of what happened over the the generation that followed, I think a, one scholar has calculated that something like seventeen thousand pounds worth of books in Georgian money, so a huge amount of money, um, went just between the two or like their partners, um, and really Market Street Philadelphia became the place in the American colonies to to pick up British books. Um, better than Boston, better than New York, better than Charleston, better than Newport. And um, a lot of that is down to the connection um, that happened uh, between Strawn and Franklin in 1743. But although I do have to say um, it was a, it was by no means um, a sure success. It was an uncertain venture. And although it works out very well for them initially as those um, sort of astronomical sums really give rise to, um, obviously we know what's coming. And at some point, these friendly relations um, are going to take some sort of turn. And um, one of the places, it obviously, it kind of creeps in. And you have this fabulous sentence in the book describing the 1750s on both sides of the Atlantic as, quote, boisterous, expansive, confident, unstable, charged with potential, but undercut with a seam of moral weakness, which is all sorts of fascinating things combined together and really gives us idea that London is the place to be for good and with some not so good things perhaps coming. So what's going on in the 1750s on both sides here? Well, yeah, I, I, yeah. This this is where I think the story becomes more complicated, but more interesting, um, because if we were to view the Enlightenment as, um, as I suppose I originally thought about it when I was um, a student, or maybe younger than that, as something which is an unquestionable good, okay, that you have progress, that people become richer, that they. Um, they become happier and that the world becomes more efficient, that people are like kind of brought out of poverty, all the rest of that. Um, then you get a very two dimensional view of what was happening in the 18th century. And Franklin, in a way, epitomizes this view because he is, as I said before, he's an optimist. He's got boundless energy. He's got bundles of talent. He sees a long way ahead. He, you know, he, he can see the way the world is developing and he wants to be part of it. In fact, he doesn't just want to be part of it. He wants to be um, in the lead. He wants to be one of the people who push things forward. But by the 1750s, you do have a kind of great reaction to this as well, or maybe not a great reaction in a, in a, in an organized sense, but you have, a kind of 
eloquent counter narrative which is building and the character i use to um to really bring this out is samuel johnson who i think is um a good character for our times certainly one to look back at when we think about this moment in in history and johnson epitomizes what you might call the anti-enlightenment um point of view it's more complicated than that because in many ways Johnson was a great enlightenment uh, himself. Um, but he was really troubled by a lot of the things that were happening in society. So Britain might be getting richer, but was it really getting happier? So all these people were being tempted out of their home parishes and um, being brought to the towns and particularly to London. Were they actually um, achieving all these ambitions, these dreams that were being uh, that were being presented to them, or were they, as he saw it, um, often ending up destitute, diseased, and um, in in very straitened circumstances with very short life expectancies and a very um, non-existent social net. That's that's one thing. But then you know, there's this kind of idea of what's happening overseas as well, because Britain may well be getting wealthier, but how is it getting wealthier? Well, one very famous instance was the um, was, was the capturing of a Spanish uh, treasure galleon in the South Seas in the 1740s, and this was seen as a as a great moment of Imperial Britain's majesty and triumph. But Johnson would look at that and he'd say, "Well, yes, of course, we've got more money. We've we've uh, beaten the, the Spanish in, a, in an encounter." In a, in a faraway sea. But, you know, what was the cost? What was the human cost of this? How many people died on the voyage? And, um, and, and listeners of yours who want to explore that question in more detail might be tempted to go and have a look at uh, a new book called The Wager, which tells um, that story in a bit more detail. Um, but to, to progress, I mean, look at what the East India Company were doing, for example, in India. They were, you know, they were displacing native populations and pretty much looting um, one of the most productive, wealthiest regions of the world and bringing a lot of the wealth back to Britain. Um, Johnson was really concerned about all this, and he was particularly concerned about the slave trade as well, which I found was um, was a really fascinating perspective so um in in one of the strangest twists i think in in the whole 18th century in the year 1752 an ex-jamaican slave at the age of eight was brought to live with johnson at gough square and johnson um lived with with a few interruptions with this um with this young boy as he became a man um for the rest of his life and uh, he became johnson's principal legatee or his heir you might say and um johnson through him was able to gain an understanding of what was happening on the plantations in the caribbean as few others in britain did at the time i mean this is um i mean quite atrocious slave trade to us today it was obviously normalized and something that was of its time but for most Britons, it was just something that happened at a distance that, you know, even if they did hear some of the more grisly um, details that they could explain away um, without having any first hand knowledge themselves. So there was this kind of sense that I think Johnson epitomised in society that all was well, but all wasn't well at the same time, that progress was coming but what cost was it coming at? And I think in that sentence you quoted back, that's really what I'm trying to distill at the time. There was um, a great deal of interest in the fate of Rome, the, the fall of the Roman Empire. This would later be written about um, by uh, by Gibbon, of course. But you know, Britain was very, very sensible of the fact that it was becoming quite a great nation. And I'm not saying that in a jingoistic Nigel Farage way. I'm saying that in in truly um, kind of quantifiable terms. It was a vast empire by the mid 18th century. It was a very very wealthy place, but people were beginning to wonder what cost that wealth was coming at, and what it was doing to um, to the the people. And um, the the quote I put right at the beginning of the book, which is one of Johnson's, is one which has kind of haunted me for the last few years, which is, 
about how as humans we are we're more given to we put more faith in dreams than reality and the quote is that the natural flights of the human mind are not from pleasure to pleasure but from hope to hope and it's this idea that we 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 chase dreams we're programmed to do so but in chasing dreams we can be led into danger and we can be led into immorality and so this is the world of the 1750s so then thinking about obviously the core phrase life liberty and the pursuit of happiness with all these things going on the riches to do more things but also the cost of it with slavery being amongst one of them how then is this word liberty that is such a rallying cry of the american revolution how and why is the meaning of this word changing from the 1750s to the 1760s right into the 1770s and to what extent is it changing in the same ways on both sides of the atlantic well again another very good question and this word liberty is um maybe the activating word of the plot that i've that i've tried to write in the book because everything i've told you about in this conversation so far relates to life this this first section in the book what was life like in the 18th century what was it like in 18th century britain what was it like in 18th century america and to a kind of i think to quite a degree you could say that there's there's a lot of similarities between the two um in terms of worldview actualities all the rest of it but liberty is also something which until the 1760s is an ideal which is held very dear in in Britain and the American colonies. So liberty in the British mind is a word with a heritage. And that heritage I can delineate for you quite quickly, I suppose. The idea was, as Britons thought of it, that liberty was something peculiar to them. It didn't exist in the same way in France. It certainly didn't exist in the same way in Russia or Poland or, or you know, in the Ottoman Empire or, um, as Britons thought of it, terrible um, autocracies such as those. Um, no, liberty was something which had come over to this special island on the north rim of Europe, about I don't know somewhere between the time the end of the the Romans and the, the time of the Saxons. In fact, it had come out of the wild woods of Germany. It had been fortified ever since by little moments of courage, and um, we can see those in Magna Carta of twelve fifteen, um, but more particularly in seventeen eighty eight slash nine when you have the Glorious Revolution and um, the Bill of Rights, so on. Um, these things are probably familiar to students of history, although the idea of how we think about liberty, maybe not quite so much. So liberty was was something special. It was like a spirit force. It was something you had if you were British. And as I tried to point out, it was something that all Britons felt they were honour bound to defend if it ever came under a form of sustained attack. And in the 1760s, that is precisely what happened in Great Britain. There was this character called John Wilkes, who today is um, pretty much forgotten. And if I say the word John Wilkes or the name John Wilkes to anyone at all, they generally think of the man who assassinated Abraham Lincoln in a theatre house, whenever it was, seven, uh, 1860s. Um, the John Wilkes who precedes him that, that later John Wilkes was called John Wilkes Booth. This earlier incarnation was an English member of parliament for Aylesbury in the home counties. He was, until the 1760s, a pretty run-of-the-mill character. He was a gentleman. He was the kind of character uh, Franklin inspired to, to join. Um, he was part of the Whig ruling oligarchy. He was friends with Pitt and Newcastle, and he was in Parliament, and he had a nice place near the Palace of Westminster. He spent too much money. He ran loose with a set of quite dissolute noblemen. And um, if that was his life, his life would have been colourful, but very, I suppose, you know, 
kind of not really worth comment. But after the end of the Seven Years War, or during the period that ran up to the end of the Seven Years War, um, there was a great deal of faction in British politics. Should the war against France, which had gone so disastrously to begin with, but then so brilliantly afterwards, should it be kind of persevered with until France could be brought to some kind of um, ultimate defeat, whatever that might be? Um, in uh, famously 1759 is known as the year of victories but after that there were more victories in lots of different parts of the world and there was a famous moment when Havana was captured from the Spanish in uh, I think 1762 I might be wrong on that but around then so there was this kind of great military ascendancy of the British and Wilkes was part of the, um, the faction that wanted to to keep going with the war, to win more spectacular victories. And uh, the leader of that faction was Pitt. There was an opposing faction, though, which was um, connected to the new king, George III, who was young, pious, devout, um, a little bit of an interferer, um, uh, not the mad King George uh, of, of legend yet. He was quite with it and... Um, I suppose a pseudo intellectual at this point. Um, anyway, he was along with his favourite and new prime minister, a man called Lord Butte. He was all for ending the war on terms with the with the French um, because it was very very expensive. There was a huge national debt, and he thought that Britain had done enough, and now the time was to concentrate on domestic affairs. And um, all of this is is background and context to, to the ferocious and nasty political split that happened in in 1763. Wilkes was right at the heart of it. He was um, a satirical writer of great ability and he was daring and he had, I mean, we'd say today he had very no filter. He's the kind of person who would build up a huge Twitter following today by throwing accusations around. But he was a bit cleverer than that because he he did take care to write anonymously and... um, he um i suppose he was he was good at insinuating rather than stating so uh, there was very little that his opponents could do to shut him up but shut him up they did in april of 1763 when his house was raided his papers were taken he was arrested and he was tried he was charged of, of writing a, a seditious libel and uh, he was locked up in the tower of london and this was one of those flash moments in the 18th century which cannot be understated because in a moment Wilkes transformed from being this slightly rakish um, character who had a knock about life as a politician into a cause celebre for English liberty. He was soon liberated from the tower um, because he was uh, locked up unlawfully and he became a celebrity. And throughout the 1760s into the 1770s, the cry Wilkes and Liberty rang through the streets of Britain and not only Britain, but America too. So this word liberty was was really, I suppose, activated at this point. And it was just the same point that the beginnings of the troubles between Britain and America were beginning and and. I, I mean, I was just absolutely struck when I was researching this story. I was reading uh, the, the, you know, the Pennsylvania Gazette, which is Franklin's newspaper, and looking at the American newspapers, and um, of course they were in a in a way parochial, and they they talked about the you know the, the farm sales and the runaways and whatever. But the big stories remained the stories from Britain. And the biggest story was Wilkes. He was just, I mean, he was as big in his day as Trump is in ours. And I just think the the, the connection in the modern mind for me is, is, is really uncanny between Trump and Wilkes. I mean, they both branded themselves um, as the number 45. Trump says he's president number 45. It was the 50, 45th number of his paper which got Wilkes into trouble for the seditious libel. They both claim to be defending the, you know, the kind of native liberties of their, their homeland. They can both bend the truth to their advantage. They're both uh, 
brilliant self-promoters and they both challenge the establishment in ways that the establishment don't quite know how to deal with. Um, Wilkes, I have to say, was a lot better read than Trump. Uh, he knew the classics. He was a very clever man. And um, yeah, <laughs> so maybe I could explore those those similarities at, a, at another point. But, but throughout this whole decade of the, the 1760s, which is really the catalytic one for American independence, Wilkes was a huge story, both sides of the Atlantic. And um, he comes... Um, He's he's actually exiled and outlawed in in seventeen sixty three four. Um, he runs away to a life of uh, of excess on the continent. But he comes back in seventeen sixty eight to reclaim his his seat in Parliament and regain his old privileges. And against all expectations, in a moment of huge bravado, he manages to win. Um, Win the seat of Middlesex in in the county, of, well, in, in the county of Middlesex, which is um, always talked about as a really important seat in Parliament, and um, and then he's uh, he's put in prison. So he's uh, you know like kind of in this very peculiar legal position. Okay, so this is all followed obsessively from the states um, from from the colonies. Sorry, and he's just seen as as an example of what can happen when you have an out of control monarch and unscrupulous government who are willing to to take the rights off people and if they're willing to take the rights off Wilkes then you bet they're willing to take the rights off you too so that's the word liberty and yet by the early 1770s, despite that massive amount of drama, and really for listeners, I cannot um, recommend the book itself if you want to get into all of the details of it, um, because there is quite a lot there, um, even more parallels to Trump, if that's the sort of thing you want to go seek out. Um, somehow in Britain, a lot of this sort of calms down by the early 1770s, um, at least to some degree, and yet absolutely not in America. Why the difference? Well, I, I think it's just a question of dis- distance. And this is uh, another really central point, and I'm glad you've brought it out, because um, the, the fundamental problem, which was just inescapable, was that 3,000 miles lay between Westminster and you know, the, the American colonies. Um, I think Edmund Burke once said that every sentence we say has a parenthesis of you know, three months before we we can get an answer, and um, and and this had a very important effect. I mean, today, you know, we have these like mad conspiracy theories that roam free, whether they're to do with climate change, or whether they're to do with um, election tampering, or QAnon, or whatever it is. You can see how disinformation spreads, and uh, like one of the the great academic. Um, I, I mean, Gordon Wood says the greatest book ever written on the American Revolution is The Ideological Im- Origins of the American Revolution. It's a book by uh, Bernard Balin, um, the great Harvard professor in the 1960s, which won the Pulitzer Prize. And a great deal of the emphasis in that book and something which really kind of stuck with me was this um, argument that, that there was in the colonies a great deal of... Uh, belief in what we might today call a conspiracy theory. And that conspiracy theory was that a malevolent set of actors in London led by, I mean, I can give you the names of the the people who, who they thought were the, the kind of villains of the piece. So there was George III, Lord North, there was George Grenville, who had the temerity to uh, foist the Stamp Act. There was there was Townsend as well, who came after him, and Dartmouth. All these these uh, Hillsborough was another one. He was the the first you know kind of secretary for the colonies. These were the kind of figures. I shouldn't forget Lord um, Butte as well, who was <clears throat> central to this idea. Who were dismantling English privileges, and they'd done it. In, in Britain with Wilkes, but they were going to do it in America. And the proof of that was was in these kind of hopeless pieces of legislation which were coming across. I mean, the Stamp Act in 1765 was the most badly formulated piece of legislation imaginable, which um, which aggravated everyone, caused riots, and um, was, you know, like kind of always is spoken about as a key moment in the run-up to the revolution. Um and and from that moment onwards, really, 
relations were always suspicious between the colonies and um, and Britain. So you, you rightly point out that by the time it gets to the the, the 1770s, things do stabilise somewhat. So the ructions of Wilkes and Liberty and all this, they, they're kind of calmed down. Um, Strawn in one of his letters to um, a friend in Philadelphia says, well, you know, things aren't so bad here. Well, I can't understand why I'm reading all these newspapers from Philadelphia that says we have riots and blah, blah, blah. Um, really, like riots were, you know, ten a penny in, in Georgian L- London. But if you can imagine what the meaning of that was back in the colonies where there's no way of verifying information where it's very easy for loud voices and sensational voices uh, voices to to gain gain traction um i think you know balin and and wood and and others who've written on this are absolutely right to 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 stress this idea of a conspiracy um against liberty which just took root to the point and and we see this today with people who are so far gone with a conspiracy that you can't talk to them. This is just, this is their worldview. And I think this very much happened. I, as it happens, I should add, in, in terms of um, academic scholarship, there's been a lot of work done on whether there was some great plan to uh, to to take the rights and liberties of Britons um, away from American colonists in, in the 1760s. And... I mean, the, the evidence that there was is kind of pretty thin. I think it was more likely a case with the Stamp, Stamp Act, for example. My understanding is that it was just a, a really bad idea. It wasn't malevolent per se. It was it was an attempt to raise a bit of money on the colonies, but it was done in such a bungled and incompetent manner that it aggravated everybody and um, and so on. But my, my thought writing the book was, well, you know, it, it doesn't actually really matter if the conspiracy is real or whether it isn't real. The, the fact is that people believed it was real. And that's really what turned people from, in, in Balin's brilliant quote, he said it turned people from being real patriots into being massive revolutionaries. And you can see this by looking through the more familiar founding fathers that we um, we hear a lot about today, Franklin being one of them. I mean, Franklin could not be a more patriotic Briton when, you know, in the early years of George III, he's talking about him as the greatest prince we could possibly have. But, you know, I mean, they just, they lose faith and then the revolution comes. It seems like an odd moment given the revolutionary revolution coming and losing faith. But of course, I have to ask before we let you go about happiness, the third word in this, really. Um, so can you take us through to a, an extent what happiness means in this context and why perhaps we also need to think about the words before it, the pursuit of, as helping us understand what this meant? Yeah, well, plenty to say about happiness. I can't give you um, the perfect formula, although Jefferson uh, might have hinted at it. There's um, So happiness in the Enlightenment age was just this great new ideal. that, that and, and it's such a kind of a nice thought in the way that um, rather than us being condemned to to kind of live these lives of toil on um, on planet Earth or, or on, you know, however people thought about it, waiting for the pleasures of the afterlife, which is the best that most people, sorry, which was the best that most people could hope for in in the years of um, maybe the Middle Ages and before. In the Enlightenment, you get the shift of of thought where really people are um, thinking about enjoying themselves in the here and now. So you get this uh, loads of great academic writing on the the, the rise of pleasure and... um, and earthly pursuits and the importance of being here and being now getting away from the metaphysical and um and th- this idea of happiness just gripped so many people even if they didn't write explicitly about it they you know were kind of moving towards it so some people were chasing happiness by uh, this is i mean the old um ideas about early capitalism that you know the richer you were the happier you might be it's a very simple formulation but a lot of people believed to that time and it you know kind of um fueled a lot of the early early growth of um of the capitalism that we know today and um 
so I, I tried to write about how the shift was coming about and why it was important to people like Franklin Johnson, who has a lot to say about the ideas of, of happiness. He, I mean, his idea was that happiness came more free virtues and, and things, but for, for Franklin, as I, as I said before, it was bound up with this idea of progress and, uh, and so on. I think it's worth saying something um, with regards to the pursuit of happiness, though, which is um, the distinction that we get to in 1776 when Jefferson drafts the Declaration of Independence. And I think it's just an endlessly fascinating um, shift. And I've written about this in a piece for the Atlantic. If people want to go and have a look at that, I might be able to explain better there. But essentially, you have this um, series of rights that people are setting out throughout the Enlightenment age, and it goes back to Locke and the idea that people have a, a natural rights to life, liberty, and a state, he writes about. And this is something which is refined and dabbled with and changed throughout the years that follow. Um, and what we get by like the 1760s or 1770s is a stock phrase that it's people's rights to pursue life and uh, sorry to to have life um to have liberty and to have happiness and in fact if you go back to um the uh, the virginia declaration of rights which was drafted just a month before jefferson started work on the declaration of independence you get um that this man called Mason in Virginia writing about the um, peoples should have the right to um, to enjoy and life and liberty and obtain happiness. In Jefferson's text, that changes in a very subtle but very meaningful way to the pursuit of happiness, um, which I was really struck by, and I thought there was a lot of Samuel Johnson in here. And Johnson was someone who'd used the phrase pursuit of happiness on, I think, four or five occasions that we know about. It wasn't a totally unique phrase to him, but it was um, distinctive enough that you, you spot it when you look back through his works like The Rambler, The Idler, Rasselas, The Dictionary, so on. You can you can spot that, that idea of pursuing. OK, and. Um, and Jefferson, we know, was a reader of Johnson. They did not get on politically at all, but I think there was a kind of grudging respect between the two. And Jefferson had Johnson's political pamphlets. And um, whether whether Jefferson took that line or that phraseology from Johnson is very difficult to say, and it's almost not my my, my interest in itself. But what I'm, I suppose, more interested in is that they were thinking along the same lines, that what kind of nation was the United States going to be? This Jefferson's here mapping out its parameters. And um, he's quite careful, I think, not to promise people that they are going to be happier, as Mason had. It's like your right to obtain happiness. Well, Jefferson doesn't say that in the Declaration of Independence. He says um, that you're going to have a right to pursue happiness. And that actually seems to me very appropriate for the kind of country that the United States has become today. It's a place of opportunity, but it's not a place of safety. It's not a place where um, if you fail, there's going to be someone there to pick you up all the time. But it is a place where the aspiration of happiness exists and where people are encouraged to, produce, to pursue it. And um, I think that goes right back to, to that phrase in the pursuit of happiness. So Rather than um, telling you too much more about that, I suppose if people wanted to read a little bit about the Johnsonian attitude towards happiness, I'd recommend this novella of his called Rasselas, which um, which he wrote in a couple of weeks in a way that shames all of his authors. He wrote it very quickly to pay for his mother's funeral in 1759. But it's a philosophical fable about happiness and how it's, quite an elusive thing and um a bit like a rainbow it, it disappears if you approach it um but in the same way that we still like to look at the rainbow do you know what i mean hmm. and it goes back in some ways to what you were saying earlier about ben franklin saying there's moments of it and we have to weather the storm because it's not going to be there all the time 
So thank you for taking us through um, those three words, obviously very short and simple, but there's a whole lot behind it as you've discussed. And obviously there's even more detail in the book. Um, But we know what happens after 1776 with the American Revolution. What we don't know is now that this book is done and off your plate, is there anything you might be working on next, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this topic that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I mean, um, it's kind of early days for me, really, because um, I... I'm trying to progress in in small and certain steps, and I, what I tend to do, I'll, I'll kind of point this out for um, for any aspiring writers as much as as readers, um, is that it's very important to think ahead because ours is one of the very few professions that when you have the triumph of finishing the book, the prize is that you're actually unemployed as a, as a result. So you have to kind of think of something to do. So it's always good to um, keep a little book of future ideas and, um, uh, you know, like kind of never, <laughs> never end up in that situation where you're, um, you know, kind of a writer hunting for a subject, which feels like a very cruel purgatory. And so at the moment I'm, I'm, looking down my list and i've got i've got a couple which which are interesting me and i'm in the reading stage without quite committing i'm i I suppose what i could say is i'm quite interested in um an earlier moment of the enlightenment i'm interested in science as well and how that um how that moved things on so questions to do with wren and newton um uh, at, at one end um and there's another character called Thomas Paine, who I end the book with, who, uh, I don't know, I feel like there's more to be said about him as I feel like there's more to be said about Johnson. So as you can see, no straight answer, lots <laughs> of um, lots of havering around. Um, lots of possibility. But I, but I quite like this part of it, you know. I think it's like, you know, as soon as a contract arrives and you've got a publication date and it, it feels a bit, you know, all is possibility at the moment. And, um, you know, I quite like that thing johnson once wrote in the rambler that um one thing that writers should always do this is to do with his ideas about happiness and hope it might might be a good thing just to relate to you at at the end is um there's a certain um distemper that he called the writer's malady and he said that no sooner is a writer struck by an idea that they are making excursions to to the press and that after that they're telling all their friends about it and prognosticating forward to the all the you know accolades and prizes and wealth that's going to come their way and so i'm trying to listen to johnson and keep the writer's malady at bay just for a bit that's my plan at least (laughs) fair enough well while you are off deciding what might be next of course uh readers can read listeners can read the book that we've been discussing titled life liberty and the pursuit of happiness britain and the american dream from 1740 to 1776 peter thank you so much for being with us on the podcast my very great pleasure thank you for having me